Hello, everyone. I think we are supposed to start. Uh, my name is Ilya Kosmodemianski, and I'm working for PostgreSQL Consulting. And uh, my today's talk would be probably about the most painful part of PostgreSQL from DBA point of view. Uh, this is the beautiful creature named Outer Vacuum. And in this talk, I try to explain some things which uh, I hope would help you to uh, live more happy with Outer Vacuum and configure it properly. So, uh, what about is this talk? Uh, first of all, uh, I will talk uh, what it is, what it is important. Uh, maybe because uh, this is a PGCon, uh, I think one and every uh, speaker talk about MBCC and some internals of transaction scheduling in Postgres. That's why I try to uh, make it fast and without some additional details. Uh, and uh, then I uh, jump immediately to uh, some best practices of uh, tuning out a vacuum, how it works, which parameter uh, influences its behavior, and so on and so on. Uh, and then um, I will stop a bit on some things which uh, work in AutoVacuum currently a bit strange from my point of view and show some examples uh, how to live with that. So um, basically uh, two uh, very uh, nice problems. Yeah. I did not manage that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've tried, but that's the maximum I have. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, two things uh, which makes uh, consultants happy and DBAs uh, maybe not so happy. Uh, is if you see a database with auto vacuum completely switched off or uh, auto vacuum with uh, default settings. So uh, basically, it, that means that there is a lot of uh, ideas how to improve the performance of that database. Uh, in other words, uh, that means that uh, this is a very stupid mistake to switch auto vacuum off or leave the settings by default. So uh, what it is, auto vacuum? Uh, modern databases, uh, databases not uh, one and every NoSQL, but the trend is many NoSQL databases trying to implement that too, uh, have uh, two major problems. The first one is uh, concurrent operations, and to live with that, uh, databases usually implement some kind of uh, concurrency scheduling algorithms and transactions. Uh, and the second problem is failures. Then something goes wrong, someone uh, switch uh, the server off uh, wrongly, mistakenly, or something like, like that. And for that purpose, uh, we usually have a right ahead logging algorithm. For Postgres, that means uh, that technically it has MVCC as a transaction scheduling algorithm. Uh, here is some simplification. Uh, I mentioned that it's a combination of locking and MVCC. Actually, MVCC also includes some locking algorithms inside of that. Uh, and uh, undoing to redo information which helps to recover database after a failure. Uh, so uh, Postgres uh, keeps redo like many other databases uh, in write headlock. Uh, but undo uh, is kept a bit non so traditional. Uh, I mean, in uh, data files itself. For example, Oracle has some undo information in special segments. So they call it undo segments. Uh, DB2 stores uh, some undo information in modern Linux versions, uh, right, with uh, log information and so on. Uh, Postgres keeps this uh, undo information right in the data fi files. And uh, that means that a normal update in Postgres uh, is not an update uh, if uh, we will speak frankly. Uh, the update is insert of a new tuple 
and the deletion of the old tuple. And uh, basically, this deletion of the tuple uh, is not actually deletion. Uh, it's just uh, no more seen in the visibility map. Uh, to explain that a bit more, the standard example, uh, Postgres has two meta columns uh, called xmin, uh, the ID of transaction which created this uh, tuple, and xmax, uh, the uh, transaction until which this tuple is visible. And if we uh, insert something to uh, Postgres, we'll see these meta columns, uh, xmax will be zero and xmin uh, will have some figure in it. So basically, if we take a look on Postgres page, uh, which has some technical header, tail, doesn't matter now. Uh, if we insert some tuple, uh, it will have this xmin and xmax. But if we would like to update that, basically it happens something like that. Uh, we just update the xmax uh, uh, and that uh, tells Postgres that this tuple will be no more visible. And it looks like that. So we have a new tuple which is basically inserted and the old tuple which became not visible. And uh, this is the problem of vacuuming the database. So basically, in this uh, moment, we need uh, some kind of garbage collection. Because if we're not, we'll have uh, very fragmented data files, and uh, that is obviously not very good because we do not need these uh, tuples, and actually, there are a lot of uh, problems based on that. Uh, first problem is uh, the famous big data. That's probably an easiest way to uh, run into big data on Postgres. Uh, if you switch uh, out to Wacom, a small table with uh, several thousands rows can be easily uh, many gigabytes in size. And that is definitely the wrong type of big data and you do not like to have something like that. Uh, and many different things. Uh, you can uh, get rid of that using old school Wacom. Uh, the manual command, which actually removes uh, all the tuples uh, which are not visible right now. Uh, I'm simplifying in that point. Uh, but actually, uh, after Wacom uh, makes that uh, better and why it is better, uh, that will be next slide about that. Um, besides of that, AutoVacuum uh, collects the information for uh, optimizer statistics and uh, performs wraparound. Uh, I will not talk about wraparound because it's uh, another topic. I just referenced a very good talk by Masahiko Savada at uh, PG Day Asia uh, about uh, freeze map and uh, lots of improvements of uh, wraparound. Uh, in a uh, new version of Postgres, I mean 9.5. Uh, please uh, look at SlideShare. It's really good talk with a lot of information. But mostly I will stop at the point that uh, because AutoVacuum uh, makes a lot of uh, things in addition to simply vacuuming, this definitely should not be uh, switched off because uh, it will be a source of problem. Uh, why uh, actually a manual vacuum is not a solution and why uh, auto vacuum was introduced in Postgres 8.4. Uh, basically, you can use vacuum because uh, vacuum command uh, performs exactly what you need. It removes old tuples. Uh, but the problem is uh, if uh, you are uh, running out of space in a single page, uh, you will need another page to allocate to put the new di data where uh, it can fit. Uh, so if you run a uh, vacuum command uh, not frequent enough, uh, your database will be bloating because uh, the new pages will be allocating uh, to fit the new data. So basically you can use vacuum manually, but much better idea is to let Postgres do it more automatically and uh, in more convenient way. Uh, actually, if uh, uh, you do not use uh, auto vacuum or manual vacuum, uh, 
uh, your data, uh, you have uh, probably uh, big data at that moment. And the only thing, uh, not the only, but uh, the thing which can actually help you is vacuum full. But it, that's a bad idea because it uh, virtually rebuilds the table from scratch and uh, that is resource consumable operation uh, which is not designed actually to be uh, run routinely on the old TPOL app database because it's very resource consumable. Uh, so uh, Auto Vacuum was introduced to make that a bit more convenient. Uh, it has some issues, but you definitely want Auto Vacuum instead of Manual Vacuum. Uh, so uh, Auto Vacuum uh, or just vacuuming is uh, the kind of job which must be finally done. Uh, the typical uh, mistake is then people try to avoid auto vacuum because it's running for hours or days and it consumes a lot of resources. Uh, and the first reaction is okay, uh, that's a, a really some buzzing thing which we can get rid of and switch it off. Uh, that's a bad uh, decision because this is a kind of work which should be finally done. If you're switching uh, auto vacuum off or killing an um, auto vacuum worker at that point, uh, you'll simply postpone the operation and uh, the amount of data uh, of dead tuples auto vacuum should uh, delete will be much, much more. So uh, your auto vacuum will, will work uh, much longer and longer. Uh, especially for uh, OLTP, uh, workloads uh, and most uh, data warehousing is actually uh, OLTP in some way too because you need to put the data in your data warehouse. Um, for most of OLTP workloads you need to um, configure auto vacuum aggressively enough. So that specific behavior of auto vacuum uh, which uh, we can describe in the terms and what it is uh, I will talk uh, in few next slides. So if you uh, see the uh, settings of auto vacuum, it looks something like that. Uh, I uh, just dropped the uh, settings uh, which are about freezing uh, because I do not talk about freezing, but basically there are. So auto vacuum is on and it is on by default and this is a good idea. Uh, basically, uh, there are extremely few cases then you probably d do not need a auto vacuum and better uh, leave it switched on. Uh, another nice group of settings which you really need to work with is um, scale factors and thresholds. So what they are. Uh, after vacuum, vacuum scale factor is uh, an amount in percents, so uh, 0 0.01 is 1% literally. Uh, in, and this triggers uh, the auto vacuum to perform actually uh, tuples removing, uh, then it checks if this table needs an auto vacuum. So for example, if you have uh, 100 uh, rows uh, in a table and only one was updated and auto vacuum checks if auto vacuum is needed, it starts vacuum in this table if you have such a setting. Uh, by default, these settings are not aggressive enough. For example, it can, I don't remember, 30% uh, or 50% or something like that. Uh, 20, 20, thank you. <laughs> uh, and Yes, uh, that means then only uh, the 20% of the data changed. Uh, auto vacuum starts uh, deleting uh, rows. And if it is a huge table, that is bad because to remove 20% of dead tuples or maybe more uh, in some cases, that can be slow and auto vacuum will work uh, a long period of time, consumes resources, and so on and so on. And that's bad because, for example, uh, if you have long-running transactions, uh, Auto Vacuum can prevent some transactions from uh, committing and 
uh, you can uh, run out of transaction IDs and there are a lot of bad things. So your auto vacuum uh, most likely uh, should uh, work frequently and in small portions. Uh, theoretically, uh, there is another uh, parameter which calls threshold. You can uh, just uh, simply set the amount of rows uh, which should be updated uh, or deleted uh, before auto vacuum triggers. Uh, by default, it's 50, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's more pr probably not uh, so convenient settings because if you have a percent setting, um, that's that's a reasonable approach uh, to trigger after vacuum because uh, you do not need to calculate and uh, you cannot forget to update the setting if uh, the amount of data in the tables changed. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I recommend to use threshold. Uh, uh, do not use threshold and use uh, auto vacuum scale factor instead. Uh, there are two scale factors actually. One is uh, analyze scale factor, uh, and the another one is um, auto vacuum scale factor. Um, I usually recommend to set uh, analyze scale factor not so aggressive like uh, auto vacuum scale factor because uh, if actually 5% or maybe a little bit more uh, of data changed. In most cases for optimizer, uh, this is not so crucial like for auto vacuum performance. Uh, so probably uh, the better idea is to use analyze scale factor uh, not so aggressively like um, auto vacuum scale factor. Oops. I'm sorry, some problem with the slides actually. So, um, uh, technically, Auto Vacuum has some uh, mechanism to um, schedule your IO impact. Uh, and uh, it looks like uh, it doesn't work now because uh, it was designed for uh, an older hardware. So, uh, what it is? Uh, after vacuum uh, process sleeps for a period of auto vacuum nap time in seconds, then it tries to perform a task to auto vacuum some table to run through the database to find the tables which need auto vacuum. And then it performs auto vacuum. Uh, it's a uh, cost limit increased. Uh, cost limit is just simple cost limit like uh, every hour cost limit in Postgres. Uh, and then it, uh, it is reached uh, auto vacuum delays uh, for uh, auto vacuum vacuum cost delay milliseconds. Uh, this is actually uh, not a good algorithm, uh, mostly because it was designed for uh, older hardware and today it's not so crucial, but uh, it has a lot of problem of design. Uh, for example, it not uh, differentiate the uh, logical and physical I.O. So it may be I.O. from disk or I.O. from shared memory. And as far as I know, um, it's, um, it's the same for this mechanism. Uh, so the results can be confusing. Uh, and actually, modern SSDs are quite fast. So such kind of external regulation of uh, I.O. Uh, is not so necessary for them. Um, and besides of that, there are several other problems with that. Um, so if you have a bad disk, really bad disk, uh, you probably should uh, buy a good disk. <laughs> That's a little bit obvious, but mm, Yes, <laughs> you should do that. Uh, but if you have bad disk, uh, uh, you can actually trick a bit uh, some things uh, about that. Uh, we usually recommend uh, in that case to increase amount of workers of auto vacuum because uh, if uh, auto vacuum is IO limitation, uh, most likely. Uh, this is a catch-22 because you have free workers by default, 
they begin to uh, work with several tables. They are vacuum in this ta those tables, and then actually the outer vacuum uh, vacuum scale factor comes. And probably the next table should be vacuumed. Then one percent of its data changed, but. It is not because you are uh, run out of auto vacuum workers. So then uh, you have uh, an available auto vacuum worker. Uh, it can be usually not 1% change in that table. That can be 50 or 80 or uh, even more. Uh, so uh, auto vacuum starts to uh, work slow and slower because there is no enough workers. And in that case, uh, this can help. You can have 10 or 20 or uh, that depends actually uh, how many CPUs do you have workers of auto vacuum at, and the result uh, can be good. Of course that will, do not, uh, that will not help if you for example have uh, two huge tables in a database or uh, three huge tables on the database uh, and basically um, the queue of auto vacuum um, is not the limiting factor because uh, this only helps if you have a lot of tables and all of them need to be vacuumed uh, regularly. Uh, so um, another idea is to uh, keep uh, auto vacuum vacuum cost delay um, lower, uh, maybe 10 or something like that, uh, because uh, lower than 10 effectively do not help a lot. But okay. Uh, that means that your auto vacuum workers will work uh, as intensively as they can, and Postgres will not regulate uh, its IO activity in any way. And in that case, you can try to uh, re regulate this activity externally. That's why I put uh, this uh, part of CronTab, uh, which uh, ionize and uh, reinize auto vacuum workers. Uh, on a regular base. Uh, please uh, keep in mind that Ionize could not work on uh, your installation because, for example, you have a uh, non uh, CFQ uh, scheduler on Linux or you have LVM or you have software rate. Uh, this work only with hardware, so uh, just try if your Ionize even work. Uh, so it's uh, it's really some kind of poor man scheduler of uh, activity of auto arc home, uh, but it helps in some cases. Uh, but actually, if you have uh, proper SSDs, uh, basically you do not care about such uh, drastic things, and most likely on SSDs, uh, you actually need to decrease this auto vacuum vacuum cost delay and uh, disable uh, auto vacuum, vacuum cost limit because you actually never need them and they do not help only uh, confusing. Yeah, Andres. <coughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Sure. So as a result on the bad disk, uh, at this graphic, actually, the red line is amount of the workers. Uh, the green graph is normal auto vacuum, and the yellow one is uh, wraparound auto vacuum. Uh, this machine was with uh, some non-expensive, I believe, Samsung SSDs or something like that, uh, which were not very fast and increasing amount of workers really helps. Uh, and of course that was not single table which uh, needs regular auto vacuum. It was relatively huge uh, database with a lot of tables. So that can help if you have bad disk. Um, about auto vacuum, vacuum cost delay. Actually this is uh, already a bit outdated uh, thing because many people starting to use uh, huge SSDs and actually they are quite available and uh, they are good about write performance and durability now. But if you have some hybrid installation, I mean you have some tables on SSD stable space or uh, and another some tables on 
uh, normal rotating disks. Uh, that can be a problem for you because out of vacuum, vacuum cause delay is a global setting. So if you try to use this mechanism of scheduling after vacuum, you probably need to uh, have um, a short after vacuum uh, for SSDs and a longer one for SSs. But uh, once again, probably the scheduling from uh, uh, scheduling using uh, NICE and IONICE is much better than using this eternal mechanism. Uh, with the replication, in addition to the things Andres mentioned, uh, can be a problem then uh, your uh, long queries on standby uh, have such error message like uh, due to conflict with recovery, your statement was uh, terminated. Uh, the proper advice is actually do not run uh, long queries on standby if you have intensive LTP on master. Uh, but there are some mechanisms to slightly reduce this impact. And uh, by default, probably uh, in that case, you need uh, hot standby feedback, switch it on. Uh, that means that uh, if on the master server, uh, the tuple is not visible to any running transaction, and actually you uh, want to uh, auto work on it, uh, it can be still in use by one query on standby. And this feedback actually is the only mechanism, as far as I know, which uh, but using which uh, standby server uh, communicates with master. But it actually sends the information that uh, certain tuples are still in use uh, on standby and prevents uh, them to be from to be removed uh, from master. Uh, that mechanism has certain overhead on bloat, uh, and the bloat on master can be uh, slightly larger than uh, bloat uh, without this parameter. But if it is 10% or something like that, and because of that, all queries on standby fit well. Um, that probably a solution for you. Uh, actually, that is, a, in most cases, the better solution uh, in comparison with uh, several delays, streaming delays, and so on and so on, uh, which are quite more complicated in uh, everyday operations. And uh, actually, before you try to change things and uh, change the parameters, uh, if your database uh, is running uh, without proper configured auto vacuum, that usually means you have bloat there. Uh, and if you simply change the parameters to uh, ag well aggressive enough uh, ones, uh, that doesn't help because uh, auto vacuum will not remove the bloat you have. And basically, you have uh, several techniques uh, to do that. Uh, first, uh, you can use pgstat tuple uh, extension, SEs, or with some uh, framework, actually, uh, to estimate if you have bot there. But if your auto vacuum was not aggressive enough, uh, most likely you have. And then you have uh, several ways how to remove the actual bot. Uh, actually, uh, you can uh, use dump restore, but if you have a huge database with intensive workload, this is definitely not the way uh, you would like to act. Uh, another option is uh, PG Repack, which actually was uh, named uh, PG Rework before. And it is a good option if you have plenty of disk space. So um, it uh, in fact, it builds the new database, the new tables, and then renames tables, and uh, it does that without any blocking and quite effectively, and uh, recluster the data. Um, the data in the indexes will be ordered well, and so on and so on. But it has a huge overhead on disk, uh, on disk space and uh, both I/O. Uh, so if uh, you have plenty of disk space, you can try to do that. Uh, the another option, if you have uh, not so plenty of space, you can try uh, PG Compact Table, which actually was made by one of my colleagues. Uh, 
uh, which uh, acts in a bit different thing for the cases than PG repack doesn't work. Uh, it actually runs through uh, the uh, table tuples and checks if this tuple can be uh, deleted and updated. So no long running transactions, no blocks, just uh, very slowly st and steadily uh, repacking the uh, database, then you have no enough space. So uh, basic pattern of using this tool is uh, to uh, work with tables, for example, during non-business hours for uh, several hours or maybe through all night or something like that. So basically that's it. Uh, so they have uh, some plenty of room to ask questions and thank you for attention. <laughs> Uh, you mean, uh, wh wh what's the main problem in this algorithm? Or? Yeah, because the, 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 the way the slides, the slides seem to imply that auto vacuum nap time itself doesn't work, but as far as I know, it works with no cost. I don't know. That's probably uh, not very clear slide because uh, m the problem is not that nap time doesn't work. The problem is with entire algorithm. Uh, so, uh, it actually naps and waits and then reach uh, cost uh, limit and then uh, delays, yes. Uh, that basically work. Uh, but it is not working uh, as good as it was designed because uh, basically the most efficient from the term, from point of view of performance way uh, to deal with that is uh, disable this uh, napping and uh, stopping to perform IOR and to reduce it uh, very roughly and externally using ionize and nice. Try it. <laughs> and <laughs> Oh. And, uh, more yeah. Yes, that that actually can be true for certain workloads. Yes, uh, I agree. Uh, but for most cases, from my point of view, actually. Uh, the internal Postgres mechanism uh, with cost delays uh, and cost limits works only on slow disk. If you have enterprise series, PCI Express, Intel, SSDs, um, okay, you can have such workload, uh, then it can help, but it should be very huge uh, workload. You have different opinion, Jan? <laughs> um, I agree with, with uh, Andre from that. Mm. Uh, 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 sure, sure. Actually, uh, you started a, a, 
uh, good enough <laughs> topic <laughs> and huge one uh, be be uh, because actually uh, these settings are mostly used with uh, dirty settings, uh, especially aimed to uh, fit the data into the RAID controller cache or SSD cache. So basically, if uh, your uh, dirty ratio and background dirty ratio is reasonable, uh, reasonably limited by uh, the size of those cache, these settings are working quite well. Uh, but yeah, actually, it's another proof that uh, PostgreSQL DBA should be much more uh, Linux DBA than an Oracle one, because Oracle uh, pretends to be an operating system itself, and uh, actually uh, Postgres DBAs uh, need to do much more things with uh, Linux itself. Yeah. Any questions? It's not actually a monitoring tool, it's an extension uh, which calls pidgets.tuples, uh, which can show you uh, the actual amount of bloat. Uh, but actually, uh, you, try, you better try to be a bit careful uh, because uh, uh, th those uh, analytics is not cost-free if you have huge workload. So it's extension, uh, I believe the standard extension uh, with Postgres, so you can install that and try. So any more? So thank you, and if you have any more questions, you can find me today or tomorrow or even on Saturday. Thank you. We have plenty of time. <laughs>